So in our last lecture, we looked at the many different seasons acknowledged by the Dawa people, the six seasons to be precise, and how activity on the land is able to reflect the change in seasons. Now, this lecture, we are going to focus specifically on celestial signals of season changes or seasonal markers. And actually, we have already covered one giant example of this. Yeah, so if you remember back to when we were talking about the celestial emu, the emu in the sky, that beautiful dark constellation that was very much used as a calendar throughout the year. Um, and so for the um, Gamilaroi people from which this story comes from, um, we can remember this section of the story here where the emu's body was just above the horizon. And that's late in our year, so that's around November that we see this. And then as this goes on, that emu then starts to disappear below the horizon. And so as we start to move into the early year, so around February or that sort of time, the emu sort of disappeared below the horizon. And what this actually signified to the Gimuro people was the coming of the cooler seasons um, were starting to come along. And so then they would start to begin to make preparations for the winter camps. In another example, the beloved open star cluster, of course, known as the Pallades. It features as a core seasonal marker for many different nations all across Australia. Now, notably, the star Alcyon, uh, the brightest star in the Pallades cluster, is widely used in Indigenous uh, astronomical traditions for forecasting seasonal change. For example, when the days are long and hot, this star is positioned high above in the sky at nighttime, as recorded by some incredible Torres Strait Islander astronomers. In the traditions from the Western Desert, then, the rising of the Pleiades cluster marks the Nina, cold weather from May to September, um, which also acts as a marker for when the local women would go out and collect vegetable foods such as um, grass seeds, for instance. And in South Australia, the Endiamatana people say that the Pallades sisters possess pouches filled with ice crystals and that they release these into the sky and they travel across it, producing frost. Beautiful. So in Gamilaroi traditions, the Pallades are also known as a group of sisters. Uh, they're actually known as ice maidens called Mie Mie who touch the ground, bringing winter with them uh, as they set below the horizon at that particular time of the year. Now, the Mie Mie, they can be heard in winter as well, uh, so the Gamilaroi tell. When thunder comes from the mountain, that is the sound of the sisters, the Mie, playing uh, in the springs and the baths. Now, one Gamilaroi story in particular talks about the sisters traveling and it talks about um, them going into the mountains to feed the springs um, and to feed the rivers. Uh, and so there could be water um, for the Gamilaroi and for everyone. However, a young hunter comes along uh, and his name is Karimbal. Now, he fell in love with one of the sisters. Uh, however, it was forbidden. She was a part of another kinship group. However, he still fell in love um, and he actually ended up kidnapping one of the sisters. Now, the other sisters, they were said to send cold, cold weather, uh, winter, wintry rain, storms, ice, snow, um, to try and scare Karambol to, to release the sister. However, this did not work. Uh, and the sisters started noticing a lot of the animals were suffering because of this winter they were sending. And so they fled and they went again to the mountains in search of summer. They were trying to melt the snow again to try and find their sister. Now, this saga tells us that the Pallades appear in the summer each year, bringing warm weather with them. However, afterwards, they travel west, dipping again below the horizon uh, when we can expect winter to return. And so again, we can go back to the Torres Strait Islands. Um, 
And they're in an interesting position because they're only about 10 degrees below the equator. Um, and this actually means that that tilt that we've seen before actually has less of an effect the closer you get towards the equator. Um, so you don't get that huge contrast in the amount of daytime and nighttime difference that you would get um, further south or, or further north in the northern hemisphere. Um, so the length of daylight then doesn't become a useful indicator for telling the seasons apart from each other um, because they're so close. So they needed to come up with much cleverer ways um, in which to determine and monitor seasonal change. So an example of this comes from the Torres Strait Islanders' observations of a well-known bright star called Vega, which is in the constellation Lyra. And this marks the wet and the dry seasons for them. And it's also indicative of native plant and animal cycles. Mm. Um, other seasons can be monitored by special winds the, the nations who live um, in, the, in those areas live by, and we call those trade winds. So trade winds are strong winds near the equator that blow east to southeast. Now on eastern islands in the Torres Straits, they're very familiar with these winds. In the Merriam Man language, Kuki is the season known to bring strong, moist, northwesterly trade winds that can often bring monsoons. This is the wet season and it occurs from January to April. Um, so stars can also assist in signaling the beginning of this wet period. Um, so when the stars begin to shine and twinkle um, as we see them in the night sky, the Mary and Mare people um, can expect to see dew collecting uh, overnight, uh, hydrating the dry soils and sort of warning them that the wetter periods are sort of incoming now. Uh, so these observations are possible because of how water vapour actually um, sits in the atmosphere and it interferes with the light as it's sort of passing through, uh, making it appear to twinkle more um, sort of frequently and, and, um, and more intensely as the level of water vapour increases in the atmosphere. And so this observation and many others explored in this lecture series show us then that there are many different ways in which seasonal information can be obtained based on um, how Indigenous peoples understand the connections between the animals and the plants and the seasons and the sky and everything that we see.